Brian O'Driscoll on Off the Ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in. It's spinning, it's spinning. Jonathan Sexton has made it. Do you feel moderately happy? No, I feel like I've been kissing my sister. I suppose. In the pocket for his drop goal attempt. Here he goes, O'Gara. He's done it. That surely is the grand slam. We target players all the time. That's part of rugby, isn't it? Let me know. Sexton, wonderful pass and stop down finish it. There'll be more than grenades. There'll be full tanks and, and, and full shells landing on the Aviva. Grand Slam winners on St. Patrick's Day at Twickenham. Ah, the only Grand Slam winners this year might be Wales in the uh, what used to be known as the Millennium Stadium. It's Friday night, Brian O'Driscoll is with us in the studio, we've got Matt Williams with us as well. Hey Brian, we wait all year for the Six Nations to come around and then the blink of an eye, it's over. It, like, it really happens very quickly. Uh, yeah, it did. Um, I think because we enjoy it so much, those things that you tend to enjoy you know, um, speed up or, or, or seem like a, a momentary thing. Whereas you know, the pain of disappointing World Cups or whatever's gone on in that the past, that goes on forever. You know, that's like, oh my god, we can't ever let that go. Two thousand seven, we still talk about it a lot. Whereas, whereas this, um, the Six Nations, it's been funny from an Irish perspective. Obviously, the wind was completely taken out of our sails, but there's been a different sort of interest because you know, oh, have we lost it? Yeah. Are we? You know, it's a car crash. Have we? Have we? Yeah. Have we? Have we peaked too soon? Have we peaked you know, out of World Cup year? And then all of a sudden, you know, we've won half decent performance against France, and we're back. We're you know potential favourites. Um, we're not going to win the, the the tournament, but um, but we still can. The fact is that we still can. Scotland need to win for the first time since 1983 against England in Twickenham. Unlikely. We have to beat Wales. No bonus points. Um, doesn't matter if they get a losing bonus point. We'll get to 19. They'll get to 18. Uh, and England won't get to that sum. So, lots of um, lots of things need to happen for us. It's highly unlikely, but the big thing is, can they get to second? And if we poop Wales' party, that would be a successful end to it. That would leave everybody going. I think it, you've got to look internally more about a reaction to the first game rather than thinking about pooping parties I think um, it's about going and beating a good team in their home patch and, and, and you know, driving confidence from that to, br- to bring forward um, and ultimately if you do beat Wales there it will be one uh, you'll be one of three teams in this tournament that's lost one game and won four yeah. um, which on, in any Six Nations is not a bad outcome because we know the competitiveness of it with our three Grand Slams in 100 years 100 plus years so um, yeah it's uh, you know what, what appeared to be a disastrous Six Nations could turn around to being a pretty reasonable one with a victory uh, in Cardiff. And you'd much rather finish well than lose the last game. Like the way that it's worked out, you know, if you're going to lose the game, better to get all that stuff out of the way. And say, oh, we worked our way through it. We learned. We grew no, into the tournament. Absolutely. And um, particularly knowing that they've had a hiccup. And um, you, if you're going to go and win a World Cup or get to a World Cup final, there's going to be some blips along the way you just have to ride out the storm and um, and the fact that they've been able to do this that it hasn't been all plain sailing where they've gotten their shock in in the early part of this year rather than you know come Scotland or come Japan in, in the World Cup I think that will serve them well um, but it would be great if they could finish on a high uh, and and drive that for that, that conference forward into the World Cup warm-ups in, in August if you're Joe Schmidt do you think this has been a successful tournament if we win this game no, but it's been a learning curve, and I think it, in in a different way. Would you have preferred to have gone and won a Grand Slam or won a won a Six Nations, uh, won, won the championship? Yes, of course you would. But if they don't if they don't learn something from this, I'd be I'd be shocked and surprised. They, I think what they what they realised is that they missed the mental pitch necessitated for big games and that will absolutely serve them well if they find themselves in knockout stages later on in, in the year that you can't rely on game plans and you know just the physical side that the mental side has to be right so you, you all, in all bad performances or bad, bad results you have to try and take something positive from it and they will definitely do that uh, in the six, six Nations Is the other side a better form that it's okay to have some bad form so long as you rectify it and that actually that's going to happen there will be players who are for whatever reason out of form come the World Cup but at least uh, some of the key players will have been through that dip in form and come out the other side 
Yeah, I think that will stand to them. I think better get the dip in flo- form out now rather than, yeah. you know, September, October. Um, because you know, on the basis of the performances in rounds one, two and three, you know, Not you'd struggle enough. to get beyond the semi-final for certain and probably a quarter-final. Yeah. In retrospect, were, were we right that the players weren't in form or that collectively, because they weren't playing well, that the opposition was nullifying our threat? That actually they, the opposition keyed off on certain elements of our game plan controlled what they needed to control and that made players look bad. That Dude, I, I think it's a bit of both. I think, it, I think it's the opposition upping their performance and, and doing their homework. And England, you have to remember, had the whole of December and January to prep for Ireland. So as detailed as, Matt, as, as uh, Joe Schmidt is, uh, Eddie Jones is almost as detailed from my understanding. He, you know, he's another insomniac. He, he's someone that you know, is writes emails to his team at three and four in the morning, calls them at obscene hours and expects them to answer their phones. I think part of that is testing, part of that as well is he never switches off. So he's another real student of the game and he would have pulled apart Ireland, Ireland's performances and, and put together a game plan that was capable of testing their vulnerabilities, which he did brilliantly. Yeah. So you know, huge credit to him for that. And then Scotland piggybacked on that, on, on, the, on the frailty that we perhaps f- uh, felt and, and showed in that first game uh, and they didn't have the firepower to be able to follow through and see that through and then Italy was a strange one where they had nothing to lose they're in a position where they've nothing to lose so they can throw it around and you know, they've lost 20 on the bounce in the Six Nations so I- in many respects you know, there were, there were going to be tricky games because you know, we lost at home straight away you've got two away games and you know, when people sm- you know, s- smell blood they get after it uh, and we still, you know, still found our way through them uh, to get ourselves back to a, to a home game against France and, and have scored, gotten five points from it. So, like, we, you know, we're pulling it apart, but there isn't a, we're not a million miles off. England were very good. We were really disappointing. You know, Scotland brought it physically. You know, we were okay. Um, our detail was off, which is unusual, and our detail was off against Italy, but we still got five points. So, got to put everything in perspective that we're still getting the job done, albeit not with the finesse that we have done in the last year or 18 months. Yeah. Um, Matty Williams, um, good afternoon, good evening to you. How are you doing? Can you tell us a little bit about what you think is the... Well, like what level are we at at the moment versus what... I'd say our best performances are 100%. What percentage are we playing at at the moment? Thanks, Stuart. I always love to talk to you. Um, Look, I thought Brian took, spoke a lot of sense just then. Uh, you know, I, I think in the long run, before we, you know, addressing your, your question, a bit, a bit of a form dip sometimes is a good thing to address problems and, and to grow. Like, I, I thought on uh, Sunday against France, I saw some really um, good signs of changes within the Irish game. Uh, I, I, I know... Uh, I heard Brian say earlier in the week, uh, just happened to be listening to, to the show when, when uh, he was talking about how the, the back three of France were just appallingly out of position and, and there was no cover from him. He's exactly right. But against England, and, and, and sorry, uh, and, and Ireland's kicking game exploited that, uh, uh, especially early on in the game. There was that the, uh, the, the beautiful kick coming out of, off, off the restart down into the corner, which set up the first try first line out. Now we haven't seen that from Ireland. Against England, Johnny Sexton did not kick the ball out of his half once. Uh, and our only kicking game going forward was from Connor Murray. Now, Connor only box kicked the ball once on Saturday. Now a lot of that was because Ireland dominated a position they didn't need to. I know sometimes stats are, uh, don't really tell the story. But I thought they changed and what had happened after New Zealand is they got picked, just like Brian said. They got, they got, everyone does their analysis, they just got picked. And they got picked really well. But they didn't have the ability to respond and to move forward. And I think they've had, they've done that now. And unless you keep growing and changing, when you get to the World Cup, everyone's going to pick you. That's just the way the game is. The analysis at the top level, the elite level of the game is, is extraordinary. Now, I've been pretty critical of Ireland's attack. And the attack that Joe has has been successful, so what do I know? But it's, a, it's a, an attack based on being really, really precise 
at the breakdowns in particular and the go forward. And when they were a little bit off on their precision, and as Brian rightly said, again, mentally I felt they were down. Mentally I didn't think they were in the right place. What reasons for that? Well, who knows? There's a whole lot there. And I, I still believe that Joe's saying he's leaving, even if it was just a subtle, um, an unconscious uh, a message the players and everyone was 1%, 2% off. The selection at ring as fullback was, was the worst thing I've seen Joe do in his time. And he's a great coach, a brilliant guy, and I, I, I admire him so much. But that was an error. But I feel they're back on track now. And, and, a, and a really solid performance against Wales, and hopefully a victory. They'll be in a really good shape coming out of this Six Nations. Um, you've got to make Wales fairly strong favourites for this game though, right? Like, it's not, it's not quite a 50-50 game. It's Wales at home. They're, they're on the run that we were on at the start of the tournament. They have all that confidence. They've come from behind against an England team who are full of confidence. So, I, like, they, they deserve to be favourites heading into this game. Well, if, you, if you're talking about mental pitch, where they are versus where we are, we're trying to stop them from winning a Grand Slam. They're trying to win a Grand Slam. And there's two different perspectives and two different prerogatives. They're playing at home. Uh, as I said uh, on Monday, they seem to you know, get in the habit of having their Grand Slam final game at home. Yeah. And um, you've got to go and win, uh, win on the road, obviously, to, to, to set that up. But um, y- you would imagine they are f- you know, favourites. They've got a very good record uh, in Cardiff more recently. Is it 13 games unbeaten, their best ever, uh, dating back over 100 years again? Um, you know, Warren's going out. It's his last Six Nations competitive game. Um, so there's lots of final things. And, and when Wales are humming, they are a very, very difficult team to beat. Add the atmosphere that will be in the Millennium or the Principality, as it's known now, that place will be rocking on Saturday afternoon. So Ireland will absolutely have their work cut out. They'll have to improve their performance by a good 20% on the French game um, to, to stay with Wales. Uh, and even still, if Wales play like they did uh, against England with that intensity and that ferocity in the second half, I think we, we will find it difficult to stay with them because their confidence of, is, is of another level. They've got another 25-30% confidence on where we are. We're trying to still play our way back into it, whereas they're absolutely brimming right now. Wales still have loads to um, come back, or at least pressure to be put on the players who are in situ ahead of the World Cup as well. Faletau hasn't played, uh, half many obviously hasn't played since that uh, late tackle by the Australians. Um, in the November International Series. So they must be feeling unbelievably confident about where they are with respect to the World Cup. Well, I, I would say Lee Halfpenny's pre- feeling pretty nervous, you know, considering how well Liam Williams gone at fullback. Josh Adams has been the real find of this year's Six Nations. I think Toby Faletau is, uh, is someone still at the peak of his powers, um, where, um, you know, you know you're getting guaranteed go forward. I think their back row, as, as well as it has done over this uh, this year's Six Nations, you know, to be able to plug him into any team internationally, you know, you would be, uh, you'd be spoiled for choice. So um, I, I feel um, that they are in a really good place. Uh, they, they're, they're, they're playing from a relatively full deck. Obviously, they've got Corey Hill out injured uh, and, and one or two others. But for the most part, they've had an opportunity of building their squad depth with their performance against Italy. Uh, and now they know what their strongest team is going into the World Cup. So they're in a, in a great place. I, I, I still don't buy into the, it's the best Welsh team of all time. I think it's a, it's a very good Welsh team. It's a confident Welsh team. But on talent, I don't think it's quite as good. But that doesn't matter for anything. Yeah, okay. talent doesn't always talent doesn't win you World Cups. Bottle and um, and heart and desire and game plan, all those things and mush squ- together. Squad depth is definitely very important, and they definitely like have that. so important, so important. Where again, where guys seamlessly can come in, and you kind of feel as though in many positions it's a like for like change, you know, it, depending on injury or form or or who gets the nod over who in in lesser games and pool stage. They don't feel seem as though they're they're losing a huge amount and. I suppose I, I've always been a fan of the likes of Scott Williams and when he's not making uh, it into their 23 where the, the likes of Watkins is coming in, Hadley Parks is going well, John Davis is back in really good form, missed a couple of bad reads at, at the weekend but, um, but other than that going, going forward they're, you know, they're, they just look as though they are oozing with confidence and they are the most dangerous team um, possibly with, with, um, with Australia when they're oozing confidence because they really feel as though they're world beaters. Yeah. Gatland has kind of slow played everybody a little bit, Maddie, with the, um, the team last year and kind of bringing a bunch of players through. And then all of a sudden, last November was their best November in years. Um, and look, 
sometimes he doesn't get the credit he deserves. Uh, as Joe was pointing out, it's three Grand Slams that he's going for in his time as Wales head coach. Ireland have three in their entire rugby history. Whatever it is that he has, it's a bit of genius. Look, Warren doesn't get the credit he deserves in Ireland because uh, when Warren was coaching Ireland, he was a very young coach and he made a lot of mistakes. I happened to uh, be coaching at Leinster and did a little bit with the national team with him. And Gaddy was a very young coach there and he, he was raw and he, was, he would speak to you about the fact that he was raw. And he made mistakes like we all do um, when we start out. We, you know, but, but he's hung around for 20 years. He's listened and he's learned and he's, he's grown. And outside of Ireland, he is massively respected um, because sim- people just simply look at, A, the longevity of his uh, career at international level, and B, they look at the trophies that he's won, including, you know, a, a being a winning Lions coach. So, you know, I think for us to, uh, or for anyone, to belittle or, or not uh, give enough credit to him, I think is wrong. A- and I think if you don't respect what he's put together, I think he'll he'll come around and bite you on the backside pretty quick. Gaddy has also put together a backroom staff that have been together for the best part of 20 years. They've all come out of Wasps together. I think that was about 2005, Brian, wasn't something around that? They've been together from Wasps into Wales on the Lions trips, and they understand each other. There's great trust amongst them. And again, they've all learnt and grown and moved forward in their own roles within that group. And what Wales have is this belief in in the unity of the group and that's a hugely uh, hugely powerful thing in a team sport when when the, the players know the coaches believe in them the players believe believe in the guy either side of them but they also believe in their staff and, and the knowledge that they're being given and the information that they've been given and when they see themselves winning like the habits of losing are just as important it, it takes on another dimension and that's the beauty of a team sport and it's a cliche but it's still true where the, the sum of the parts is, is greater than, than the individuals you know greater than the whole it's, uh, it's, it's a quite an extraordinary thing that doesn't mean they can't be beaten on Saturday that do, I'm, not, I'm not saying that but Gaddy you've got to take your hat off with him just like we do with Joe and say look he's, they've done a great job Talking about that respect, you know, you do you feel it's in New Zealand now? Do you think you you think that he doesn't have the respect in Ireland that maybe he deserves? Do you think um, opinion has changed since the Lions tour down there two years ago? R- really good question, Brian. Um, I, I, I'd hate to I'd hate to put my um, my hat on and say yes, but I, I don't think it has. And I, I think in New Zealand they they take a very dim view um, of, of people that that go away for long periods of time. Uh, having said that, you know, both Graham Henry and, and, the, and the current uh, national coach were all, um, all coaching at Wales. So there's no reason why they wouldn't. But I, I, I feel that, they, that, the Nash, that the people looking towards Scotty Robinson at the Crusaders where, where Ronan uh, O'Gara is, more than they look at at Joe and and uh, Gaddy, and I think Joe's probably a little bit in front of Gaddy, believe it or not. But it, it's quite an unusual thing. But that, that's also a New Zealand, um, like it would be, a, a less in Australia. But the New Zealanders said, if you leave, you leave. You don't you don't come back. They do bend it, but uh, it tends to be a feeling within the community. Quick question for you: Why has Gatlin been able to maintain the level of commitment that he's got from the Welsh players for such a long period of time? Not, an, not an easy thing to do, and particularly talking you know, on Matt's point that he's he's had pretty much the same coaching staff. Usually, what happens with a head coach is that the you know the other moving parts of the coaches underneath them be new forwards coach, new defensive coach, new voices coming in. But Rob Howley and Sean Edwards have been there forever pretty much from day one. Uh, so it's, it's all the more amazing. I'm sure other backroom staff have probably changed um, behind, behind the scenes, guys that we wouldn't be as privy to as, as what we you know, watch on a Saturday afternoon or know in, the, you know in press conferences. But all the same, to have those same voices um, delivering, I'm sure, you know, quite similar messages. I know they've, they've evolved their game plan quite a bit over the course of the last 10 years. Yeah. But even still, it, that, that makes it more impressive that they've managed... Um, to not be ousted by the players, or not be, you know, but, but not be nudged because you know we've had enough of hearing this voice that you know that's it's it, you know it's 
team meetings on repetition, on repeat, yeah. uh, no more. So to do that for 10 years is a pretty phenomenal achievement. Yeah, it's a bit mad. Um, and the, like, he's conscious of the fact that he doesn't get credit for everything. The whole Warren Ball thing, he, that was a touchy subject when we were talking to him last Christmas. Another touchy subject uh, last Christmas when we were talking to him was um, Sean O'Brien's criticism after the Lions. Sean O'Brien was obviously named in the team yesterday. So this is the first time that we were going to see Sean O'Brien up against Warren Gatland since the Lions tour. Here's what Gatland had to say when we had him at a Heineken Roadshow. Uh, it was Christmas 2017 now. Have a look. We had a good chat and like I said, I don't have any, any problems with him. I just thought there was, a, there was a better forum for him to address it than that. You might be sending your uh, Big 12 down the uh, number 7 channel in the Six Nations for the first couple of, <laughs> first couple of minutes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, the ironic thing is that kind of, if you're going to come out and be critical, um, then you've got to back it up with other things. So I, I went and had a look and went, OK, I've been with Wales for 10 years, and I'm thinking, OK, so in that 10 years, so Sean didn't play in the game against in Chicago, where Ireland beat the, the, um, the All Blacks, and in that 10-year period, I know he's had a few injuries, he's only ever played on one Irish team that beat Wales. So... To me, you've got to have a, a little bit of a better record than that. The beef is real. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just saying, you, I mean, if you, I mean, you've got to... That, does, that, does, I, don't, I don't think that's... That, that's kind of like me just going back and going, you know, if, if you're going to be critical, then you've got to make sure you've got something to back it up with, don't you? Does it add a little bit of spice for the, for the game, or is it, are they two very separate entities? For the Six Nations. For the Six Nations, yeah, for the Ireland game. Probably. <laughs> ah, happy days. Here we're going to get to see it. Yeah, so, like we we've, we've waited a long time for for it. It it feels like an eternity ago that the um, that that Lions tour took place. So um, to have that comeback, I've forgotten about it, it's, and it adds an extra little bit of spice. And I wonder, does he say it to his team? Do his team, do his coaching staff say it, or do the players think it themselves? Um, but you know, listen, it's hard to argue with anything that he said there. It, it really is. You know, it probably wasn't, um, you know, Sean's best um, snapshot of, of, of a quote. I know he gave it down the, um, was it, uh, down the planning championships. Um, sometimes you get caught in your environment where you don't know where those words are going to extend to. But needless to say, it was, you know, a piece like that's going to get picked up by the media very quickly. Um, and, you know, they still delivered, you know, they still drew a series down there. So I, I, I can have a little bit of sympathy. On this occasion, I can have some sympathy with, with Warren, why he would feel put out um, by a player not coming and approaching him during the tour and saying it afterwards. Yeah, Matty, it's a nice little subplot for this game. It's great that Sean O'Brien is actually back fit, of course. So I'm sure Sean O'Brien's going to put in a big game knowing full well that uh, he's going to have to shake hands with the Wales coach afterwards. Yeah, and so he should. Uh, I, I'm a great fan of Sean O'Brien. I, I don't know him well, but I've met him a couple of times. He's just a fantastic guy. I was really, really surprised in the environment that he said it. And I'd, as Gaddy said, I think the, you can say anything to anyone, but within a team, that's not the way we usually do things. You usually front people up face-to-face when no one else is listening uh, or, or, you know, in, in, in the appropriate environment. So I was... I've got to say I was a bit disappointed... Uh, that it, it occurred that way. Uh, if I was coaching, and I, I fronted players up, I, I front them up, I mean, I do front them up. Players I used to coach say things in the media about me, I find them and I go and talk to them. I say, mate, I've got something to say to you. I say it to your face. I don't say it through a media. Don't, don't, you know, I'm not going to go to the media and complain. You say it to my face. You've had plenty of chances. Why did you do that? I said, I think that's cowardly. And, uh, mate, you should see them squirm. They're like, they're like you drop a worm on a hot, hot, uh, hot plate they're spinning and twisting they're trying to get out of it it's not a pleasant thing and and sean he's you know he should shake his hand and, and be the man about it. i'm sure he will yeah looking forward to the performance that o'brien puts in now yeah he'll he'll definitely be uh, there'll be an extra nervousness um on two fronts obviously we haven't seen vintage sean o'brien since that tour and um, because of the, you know those number of injuries that he suffered since um and being left out last week would have been disappointing to him. And, and this is a real chance for him to get one up, I suppose, on Gats and, and put right you know, those words that, that Gaddy said to us, um, whatever it was, 15, 16 months ago, um, that you know, he doesn't have that many victories against Wales. That, um, it's good that know, he knew all those stats, isn't it? He'd he, go and look them up. Like, that wasn't, uh, wasn't just an instinct he had. He was like, 
checking that facts and figures. Did he in the, is he in the team that day? He's not in the team. Coaches oh, always do that stuff. They know he's coming on a chat show. He's going to know. Um, he's going to be asked some tricky questions. He has, has to have some good answers for it, which he did. A great answer. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so there's an extra there's a, there's an extra edge from both sides, but I'm sure that Sean will be really focused on on churning out a big performance because. You know, if he plays well, he, he gives the team a, a great platform to be able to go and uh, and put out their better performance, but also prove an individual point to to an old coach of his um, after those words. So, listen, it'll all be done, uh, forgotten um, when uh, when the final whistle goes, and they will shake hands, of course. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure Shawnee will probably you know have some words prepared uh, when he does see him. But right smile. Um, I'm sure, but uh, so much of it, those words will be miles. Uh, easier to deliver if um, if they have a victory. What about Tyg Byrne? Tyg Byrne finally getting his opportunity here in the Six Nations. Um, during the week, Joe Schmidt said he would have got in last week, but he had a bit of soreness. So that's good to know that he's not out of the picture because it looked like he'd fallen down the pecking order. So he's in. It's the biggest game. Like It's the last chance he has to guarantee himself a place on the um, plane, assuming everybody's fit. So he needs a big game. But yet I expect a big game from him. Yeah, I, you, he doesn't tend to to churn out poor performances, um, he uh, has been, you know, so good for for two seasons with Scarlets, and now this year with, with Munster has been very, very good. I like the selection. Um, maybe it's a, it's a good thing that he he's been held back um, for the t- for the game against Wales, again playing against a lot of his old teammates. They have huge respect for him. They really rate him as a phenomenal player, a really good guy. Was you know real part and parcel of that that Scarlet squad that went to the. A European semi-final that got to a Pro 14 final. I don't think they. No, that was when they lost to Leinster as well. So, um, you 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 definitely get the sense that um, that you know he will he will also want to deliver a big performance against um, guys that he knows very well because it's nice, you know. It's one thing beating someone you don't know. It's really sweet beating someone you do know and that you can have a chat and share a beer with afterwards and that you know you're going to be hanging out with. It's miles easier having that conversation, um, you know, having having put them to the sword. He also gives you a really uh, completely different type of game and a flexibility to play a type, different type of game, a horses for courses opportunity in the World Cup. Say we come up against South Africa or New Zealand in the quarter final, and you decide that you, you know, you, whoever in your back row is injured, who's your normal um, uh, ball hog, then if you need that in the second row, you can stick him in and you know you're going to get it. And there's no real significant diminution from what you're getting from everybody else. Well, he, he, he's a great bench player. Um, he's Because he plays second row, because he can play at six as well, um, as, as is Ian Henderson, it would be really interesting depending on, on you know, what that second row pairing is if Devon Toner comes back and he's fit and, John, and plays with, uh, with, uh, with James Ryan. Y- you feel as though that's the number one partnership because particularly because of line out and because of how much we rely on on yeah. the line out and how good Devon was in the New Zealand game when we won those coaches tend to remember those victories and when players have really stood up for them which he did on that day so you, then you're looking at your your 16 to 23 and I just feel that that Henderson obviously the fact that he plays second row and can play at six uh, but but equally Ty Byrne you know his ability to pl- to play at eight um, to play uh, at six as well, at, you know, if, if if push came to shove, is a lovely thing to have on on your bench because sometimes you, you, you look at eighty minute guys. James Ryan and, and Devon Toner are eighty minute players. They're not bad, yeah. So you know, if you're if it's a battle of the back rows, it's lovely to bring off two two lots of fresh legs and plug it into your back row versus just one. So he does bring something very different. He obviously brings that massive threat um, at the breakdown. He he tends to steal at least a ball a game um, in in that jackal position. Very good at. Mole, uh, 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 mole defense as well tends to lock an awful lot of balls up. Yeah. Um, Even when he doesn't get a turnover, it's the pressure and the slow and everything slowing down, and that that ruins. I'm committing other numbers where where players might ordinarily have dropped out of a mole or fall off uh, off a mole to then reload outside the ten. Now they realise with those arms reaching over the top that they have to prize them off. So you're committing more numbers, and therefore you're diluting the attack uh, of the opposition. So in defence, in particular, he's an uh, he's he's he's. Uh, 
um, a, a real piranha. But um, but in attack, he's he runs some clever lines of running. He's not the biggest guy in the world, so I think he has to be smart with his lines of running. Um, you know, he scored a wicked try for for Scarlett with some unbelievable footwork against Bath a couple of seasons ago. So he he he's a ball player. Um, so. Whatever the issues have been, if it's been, um, if it has been a bit of personality, if it has been um, a little bit of unfitness to, to this point, uh, he's been given an opportunity, and, and uh, what an audition he, he has for for the World Cup later in the year. Yeah, those familiar faces. Hopefully, uh, we're going to let you go now. What's your prediction for the game? Uh, I, I I don't know. I I feel as though Wales are favourites. So should they should they just sneak it? Probably, but but. But I think it'll go down to the last five minutes. Both teams play their best rugby at the end of this tournament, traditionally. There's been a few... Wales in particular. There's been a few tournaments where we started well. There was the one, the game you played with Zebo was a mad game. That was the first game. And they went and won the, uh, they went and won the Six Nations that year. We beat them in round one. Yeah. And they went, and that was the, it was 2013, I think. So a draw? And, no, so we beat them we beat and them. then they, right. uh, yeah, we beat them and then the, they went and trounced England at home to win the championship. So, should we expect one of those games where it's like a bit crazy, or is this going to be thirteen, twelve? No, I think it'll be. Both teams will 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 score points. I feel as okay. much as um, I think their defence isn't um, without its frailties, but we've also shown that we can get a little bit narrow in defence, and they are a team that can really exploit that with the quality of their passing and their uh, and and their speed out wide, and with Jonathan Davis at thirteen. So, I'm really intrigued to see the battle of Jonathan Davis and Gary Ringrose. Um, it would have been lovely to, for, for the two of them to have gone at it on the Lions tour a couple of years ago. It probably came a, six months too early for Ring Rose, but um, that was, should be a really brilliant contest. So a uh, high-scoring game, and you can see either outcome really. Happy. Yeah, I can. And, and you listen, you, you have obviously it would be brilliant for Ireland if they could they could edge it. Um, I just sense that w- with Wales, you know, playing at home and the confidence that they have, I think. They might just have enough to get it done, but I really wouldn't be surprised if we put, churned out our best performance of the Six Nations. All right, Brian, good stuff for that. Uh, we're going to stay with uh, Matty, our rugby coverage here. So thanks to Vodafone, team of us, everyone in. Matt, what's your prediction? What do you think is going to happen? Gee, I, I, you know, Brian, I summed it up brilliantly. You know, I, I, I just think Ireland, you know, great teams don't become bad teams. And Ireland, at the end of 2018, were just playing such magnificent rugby, such assurance. And they've had it. They've they've got a bit of the wobbles. They've lost some confidence, but they got back on track last week. They're still nowhere near as good as they were in November. But that's a good thing. There's there's room for growth. They could, to come back to where they were, and I think that they've they've got some real motivation to go out and put things right. Uh, in the pack, in particular, I, you know, I think Sean O'Brien will come out and want to say something big time. As will as will burn, you know. I, I think they're going to want to put something out there in, in a massive way. Now, Wales are still favourites. You know, you, if, if to to just be on the the field there during warm ups and hear the volume of the singing, if you, anyone that's done that knows it's like nothing else in the world at that point. And you need the you know the mental strength required to overcome that atmosphere is quite extraordinary. But I think Ireland have got that. But but Wales have got a huge motivation themselves. They've got the crowd, they've got the home game, they've got a grand slam sitting there. So for Ireland to win, it's going to take a, a pretty special performance. But they're capable of doing it. And I think anyone that comes out before the game and really says, oh, look, this is who's going to win, and there's no doubt about it, I mean, that's not true. It's it's going to be a, a really fantastic game. It's not, I don't think it's going to be a high-scoring game, but I think the drama is going to be in the, in the in the red levels, it's, it's, it's something to really look forward to. Yeah, let's just assume that both teams do get a, a pretty good performance and whatever happens, happens in terms of the outcome and the result. If, if they both get a performance, they'll both feel pretty good about what's going to happen between now and the World Cup because, um, you know, ultimately, while this tournament will always be in the record books and while victory is important, unfortunately, it's just the reality that this shadow of the World Cup hangs over every single action that happens this year. Uh, on every game in every country around the world. So if you listen to Super Rugby, as soon as a player goes down with an injury, first thing they say is, oh, World Cup year, that's not good. Uh, so it's everywhere. Uh, I think there is a reality there, though, Joe. I think if Wales lose, they're, they're going to be 4-1. and one. And if Ireland lose, they're going to be 3-2. and two. Uh, And um, Will Greenwood heard him say in January, you know, you're going into a World Cup year. 
you can lose one game, but you don't want to be losing two. Uh, pretty sage advice from a World Cup winner. Um, you know, that, very, that, that England side is probably the great template for all Northern Hemisphere sides. They won, a, they won in the Southern Hemisphere, which Ireland have done. They came back and um, they, they were very strong Six Nations before going down into, uh, into Australia. They got a bit of luck at that 2003 World Cup, which you need. Um, but I, I wouldn't like... I, I think Ireland will be in a, a lot uh, less advantageous position than Wales if they lose this game. Yeah, 3-2 is not a good place to be. Marty, enjoy it, whatever happens. Thanks a million for joining us today. Pleasure, Joe. Always a pleasure. Brian O'Driscoll on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us. Everyone in.